My name is Larry Fullerton. I'm a partner at Sidley Austin here in Washington, D.C., and I'm very pleased to be here today to interview Ann Bingaman, who served as Assistant Attorney General for the Antitrust Division for the first three years of the Clinton administration, from June of 1993 to October of 1996. Ann had a very distinguished career in private practice before going to the division. Uh, when she was elected a fellow of the American Bar Foundation, a member of the American Law Institute and a trustee of Stanford University. We've been friends, Anne, for many years and law partners, and I was lucky enough to serve as one of your deputies uh, when you were head of the division. Welcome to the program. Thank you, Larry, and I was lucky to have you. Well, let's start with some background. Uh, you were born in Jerome, Arizona. You grew up in Phoenix. You were the daughter of a grocer who never went to college. Uh, you went to college and to law school at Stanford where you met your husband, Jeff. That's Jeff Bingaman, the Democratic Senator from New Mexico. When did you first decide you wanted to become a lawyer? Is it true that you were inspired by Adlai Stevenson? It is true, odd as it seems, that a nine-year-old child in 1952, a girl at that, would I was crazy about him. My parents were FDR Democrats. When he lost, I cried for days. And I just decided that Lee Stevenson was a lawyer. I should try to be a lawyer. And I kept that in mind, and sure enough, here I am. Well, how did you um, uh, develop your interest in antitrust? It was completely accidental. The current phrase of black swan would apply to that. Jeff and I married after law school, went to New Mexico. Actually, it was a phenomenally lucky thing for me to go to such a small state. In 1969, when we got there, there were 800 lawyers in the whole state, 10 women lawyers in the whole state. And the state was so small, the bar was interested in who each new lawyer was. I mean, genuinely interested in how they fit in, who their uncle was, things like that. So I got... I knew people from the beginning, and they knew me. I, there were no stereotypes, because within six months, people knew you as Ann Bingaman, not a woman lawyer. So I was fortunate I became the first female associate of a law firm in New Mexico. I was the first woman law professor in the University of New Mexico Law School. I was granted tenure, but left to start my own law firm by fate because law firms in Santa Fe in 1977 still didn't hire women. But that was a lucky break for me because three days later after starting my firm, I was hired by a small firm who represented United Nuclear, mm -hmm. a uranium producer against Gulf Oil Corporation. Gulf had bought the entire output of the mine at Grants, New Mexico of United Nuclear, although Gulf also had a mine and uh, the case had been proceeding on a commercial impracticability theory, but there had been committee uh, hearings in Congress in June of 1977 by Frank Moss, a representative about Gulf's role in an international uranium cartel, and the Bigby firm, Harry Bigby was the head of the firm, decided they should do something with these cartel facts, and by a miracle, it fell to me and uh, it was the greatest break of my career, really. Well, what were some of the challenges in that case? Well, the, the challenge was, really, there was very little evidence of the cartel activity. The Friends of the Earth had broken into a cartel member's office in Australia. <laughs> no, literally. And that was the genesis of people's awareness that there was such a thing as the International Uranium Cartel. Uh, it turned out all of the documents of Gulf were deliberately kept in Canada. And to this day, they've never come to the United States. Not that much is really known about the uranium cartel, but the hundred or so documents that existed clearly showed for several years monthly cartel meetings, uh, allocations of bids to particular utilities, bid rigging to give the appearance of competition. So it was a genuine functioning price-fixing cartel. And the part of the case I did, which was the antitrust theory, because there was no documentary evidence and Gulf refused to answer the 100-page set of interrogatories I filed, <clears throat> we went down a path of Rule 37 sanctions for bad faith failure and discovery, no documents, no interrogatories, witnesses wouldn't testify in any detail about the cartel. When United Nuclear 
came to the end of the plaintiff's case, we filed a motion to dismiss or for summary judgment, default judgment based under Rule 37 and sanctions for failure to produce crucial discovery to our ability to prove our case. So the case, the trial judge entered a default judgment valued at over $1 billion in uranium prices then present at the March 2nd, 1978 when the contracts were voided. This is a, a leading case. Uh, did it shape how you viewed international cartels and play a role in your later work at the oh, division? Oh, very much so. Uh, I went on and represented several other producers who had also had their entire output bought up by Gulf. You see, a cartel has to get excess supply off the market or the higher prices can be undercut. So gathering in any independent supply is a central part of any cartel activity. So I, I was a part of the teams on Exxon, Ohio Reserve, Houston Natural Gas. And uh, uh, so I spent about five years in various cases on the uranium cartel and did other antitrust cases as well in New Mexico before coming to D.C. And I became acutely aware of the reality of international price fixing cartels and the prevalence of them. And so and when I came to the division, I, I was very focused on trying to bring major price fixing, international price fixing cartel cases. Mm -hmm. Well, let's talk for a second about your appointment and your general enforcement philosophy. Uh, Bill Clinton was elected in the fall of 1992. You knew Hillary Clinton. But is that how you came to work at the division? Larry, you know the truth? I don't know how I came to work <laughs> at the division. I knew Hillary only uh, slightly years before in connection with the Children's Defense Fund, of which she was chairman of the board. I asked various friends of mine in Washington to recommend me for the job. Who they talked to, what they said, I never heard. Uh, I did eventually get a call to interview with Janet Reno in late March of 1993. I went over there and had a wonderful interview. She was amazed and I knew all of her lawyer friends in South Florida, but it was because I'd been doing a case for the Attorney General of Florida for four years down there, so I knew a lot of Florida lawyers. And uh, I did, in fact, get the appointment and begin the job. And my recollection is Jeff Jeff had no role in... Jeff had absolutely no role. Early on, I said to him, talk to nobody, say nothing to anyone. And the reason for that was to be head of the antitrust division is obviously a major prosecutorial role. You've got to go up against the biggest companies in the world. To me, the president of the United States, looking at a list of potential people, if someone's husband had been calling about the job, that that is not the kind of person, at least I would appoint. I would figure you've got to stand on your own feet. You can't be hiding behind a spouse to try to get a job. So I viewed that as uh, just off limits, and he, he really had no role in it. You became very good friends with Attorney General Reno, and that served you well during your time at the division. Janet Reno was phenomenal to me personally and to the antitrust division. She announced all of our cases with uh, stand-up press conferences. She gave us credibility and visibility we never would have had. And it was really necessary to rebuild respect for the importance of antitrust and to raise its profile, and both for American business and American consumers. She used to come to our Christmas parties. We had private staff parties, no outside lawyers invited, and Janet always came by. People loved that, that the Attorney General came to the antitrust division party. So she was a great friend to me, but more importantly to the division. How much contact did you have with the uh, White House during your time? I The only contact we had with the White House was on policy initiatives like telecom policy mm -hmm. primarily, uh, some international uh, telecom issues. The, the Clinton administration had an extremely strict Chinese wall that they announced at the beginning, which was that at the division level, of which there are 12 divisions in the Justice Department, there was to be zero contact between the head of a division and anyone at the White House or in the administration, that was completely honored. No one ever talked to me about a case. Our cases were done solely at our discretion. 
theoretically, there could be contact at higher levels to John Schmidt, who was the associate, or Jamie Gorelick or Janet Reno, but I never heard a word about it. We were, we were living in a perfect bubble of uh, trying to do the right thing. It was actually a wonderful situation. Now that's certainly my recollection. And given your background, some in Washington might have been surprised to hear you praise Bill Baxter, who was President Reagan's first Assistant Attorney General, and hear you say that you wanted to preserve the 1992 horizontal merger guidelines. Should they have been surprised? Well, I suppose it wouldn't be obvious how well I knew Bill. I had been a student of his in antitrust in 1968, as was almost everyone at Stanford Law School. Mm -hmm. He had a fabulous course. People loved it. Uh, he drew diagrams. He was a frustrated economist. Actually, not that frustrated. He, he was deeply into economics. It was a great course. And uh, I stayed close to him, not close in a extremely close sense, but friendly. I tried to hire him as an expert in one of the cases I had in private practice. Saw him several times in that connection. And when I was appointed, I immediately called him and told him I'd like to come out to California and talk through with him mm -hmm. any views he had. He recommended Steve Sunshine as a merger deputy, and uh, Steve did a great job for us. The merger guidelines to me were just sensible. Mm -hmm. uh, it would have been crazy to go back and revisit something that worked, that had the support of the bar, that were jointly issued by the division and the FTC, so I never gave a moment's thought to doing anything but going forward with other things that needed addressing. Mm -hmm. George Priest, a uh, law professor at Yale, was quoted as saying that you and your team at the division showed, quote, populist leanings tempered by a lot of good common sense. Would you agree with that characterization? I would love to agree with that. I'm very flattered that George Priest would say that. Uh, I, I assume the reason he did was because we were not ideological. Bob Layton, myself, Steve Sunshine, Diane Wood, our whole group, Rich Gilbert, our group of deputies, we were really focused on enforcing the law and getting the facts and understanding the cases we were thinking about bringing. There was not an ideological strain to any of us, so I assume that's what he was focused on. As I mentioned, you arrived at the division in June of 1993. What did you find there? I found a group of people hungry for leadership. Jim Rule had left in June of 1992. Charles James had been there until December. Mark Gidley, three or four weeks. But after that, about six months, John Clark, a division uh, very respected, but had been head of it. And the, the career staff at the division are very loyal and very trained and looking to political leadership for direction, what's going to happen next. So people were glad to see me get there and see the team I was going to bring. But the second thing I found, honestly, I was amazed to find that two-thirds of the division computers were 1978 Wangs. This was 15 years later. No paralegals, uh, no way for, no email, anything remotely like that. So I, I really was concerned about our ability to litigate the kinds of cases I hope to bring. That was one of your first initiatives, as I recall, was to improve the division's ability to litigate. And you've mentioned some of those things. What were, what were some others? Uh, you visited Senator Hollings, for example. Yes, I did. In July of 1993, Tom King and I went up to see Senator Hollings. Uh, I had prepared a series of litigation charts that I literally stood up in his office. A lot of people may not be aware, but Fritz Hollings was a phenomenal plaintiff's lawyer in his day, just a tremendous, which you could see in what he did on the Senate floor. So I had no names, no, uh, no confidential information, but I'd list industries and the type of conduct that we needed to bring cases on, and I'd have them listed on this, these litigation charts, and Fritz would say, tell me about that case, and I'd describe the fact, say, good case, tell me about that <laughs> case. And, uh, and then I told him also the division was the only division in the entire Justice Department that suffered cuts from 1980 to 92. Every other division, every other part of justice grew substantially in the 80s and early 90s. The division was 200 lawyers below 
what it had been in 1980 despite an explosion, exploding economy, uh, growth in all sectors, uh, technology coming to law practice. So we needed lawyers, we needed paralegals, we needed technology. And the result of that, as I recall, was several million dollar supplemental appropriation and then um, favorable treatment and appropriations there, thereafter. Yes, uh, I, I think the appropriators saw what we were trying to do. I made it my business to sit down with every appropriator in the House and Senate uh, State Commerce Justice Subcommittee of Appropriations. I thought it was only fair that they know what we were doing with the taxpayers' money and to tell them in some detail. So I tried to spend 30 to 45 minutes at least once a year. and. Uh, the budget when I got there was $60 million. When I left, it was $90 million in three years, a 50% yeah, increase, and it made increase. a huge difference in our ability to accomplish what we needed to do. Well, what were your substantive enforcement goals going into the division? I, I entered the job very focused on the 21st century. We were seven years away from that, and that meant, I thought, the division should bring cases relevant to the economy that was then developing and clearly would continue to develop. And that meant international uh, antitrust, it meant intellectual property, it meant health care. And I also thought the division should focus on large civil cases and large criminal price fixing cases because that had been the hallmark of division enforcement in the past. And so that's what I wanted to do. And one thing that impressed so many of us was that you went out and talked to predecessors and others that worked at the division and generated a, a blueprint. I did. I forward. really felt that I had been a private litigator for 15 years. I, I understood antitrust litigation in the trenches. Uh, I wanted to get the views of my predecessors. Uh, I talked to most deputies, AAGs, back to Tom Kuiper, uh, leading academics, Phil Arita and Bill Baxter among them. Uh, and leaders of the antitrust bar with just the simple question, what do you think the division should do? And I got a lot of wonderful suggestions. And uh, at the end of that, by the middle of July of 1993, I had a 40-page agenda that I gave to all of the section chiefs and deputies. We had meetings about it, and it was very, very useful because it's easy to play defense in those jobs. Things start coming at you, and yeah. it's very helpful to have a focus on where you want to go as well as handle what comes in. Well, let's look at each of these areas in just a little more detail. You mentioned first international antitrust. What were your initiatives in that area? I, I wanted to raise the visibility of international antitrust and was lucky that Diane Wood, who was then a professor at the University of Chicago, agreed to come to Washington and be the first international deputy. Diane also led the effort to put out a new set of international guidelines to replace a controversial set of 1988 international guidelines. Uh, she also made repeated trips abroad to talk to other antitrust enforcers about signing cooperation agreements under a law that we had gotten passed, the division's initiative, David Turetsky led it. But with Senator Hatch and Senator Strom Thurmond, big champions, which would allow the sharing of grand jury materials with a country anti-forcement authority that issued confidentiality guarantees and so forth. The, we didn't have a lot of luck getting signatories to that, I think, because of the natural fear of turning over a country's national companies to the right. U.S. antitrust. But we, Diane's visits, and there were many, raised the profile of our concern about international price-fixing cartels. Later, when Archer Daniel Midlands became public, uh, I think these authorities realized that we knew what we were talking about as far as the prevalence of cartels. ADM was an important antitrust case that you just mentioned, and also Microsoft and, and uh, Pilkington. Yes. On Microsoft, we cooperated with the EU. It was the first ever joint case with the EU and the antitrust division. We also brought the Pilkington case uh, under intellectual, it was an intellectual property restrictive licensing, anti-competitive patent licensing case. And Microsoft itself is a form of international uh, IP mm -hmm. issues. 
IP was the second area you mentioned as an area of emphasis. Um, Why did you get interested in IP and, and what were your initiatives there? Uh, as odd as it may seem, I had followed Silicon Valley uh, and technology issues for most of my professional career. Early on, I had worked briefly for a firm in Phoenix that did a lot of Silicon Valley work while Jeff was in the Army. And fascinating things. I wouldn't claim to understand all of it, but if you get something in your mind early on, you notice things in the newspaper, you read articles and so forth. So it might have been surprising. I don't know how many people know this, but I, I was actually very interested in technology. And when the, uh, when the FTC deadlocked on Microsoft, I was focused on technology in that case because of that. But IP specifically, uh, I thought was such an important area of the economy that was sort of buried. It was, didn't, wasn't as obvious, but as prevalent. Uh, everything in our economy, from uh, carpets to TV cameras to, you can hardly name anything that doesn't either have a copyright, a patent, or something patent pending on it. Uh, it's just huge, and the potential for anti-competitive effects from license agreements that restrict others is huge. So I thought intellectual property should be focused on part of this 21st century. And these guidelines proved to be very important in helping uh, antitrust lawyers counsel their clients and shaping cases going forward. Yes, on. no, and Rich Gilbert led the guideline efforts. We chose guidelines as a way to educate the bar, really, mm -hmm. as to the division's concern and set the rules of the road. We did them jointly with the FTC. I think it did help the, raise the profile of intellectual property violations, and I, I think it's been beneficial. Healthcare was another area of uh, attention. Why did you, why'd you get into that area? Well, healthcare, you know, because of the Clinton interest in it, it was in the papers basically every day. It's 12, it was then 12% of the U.S. economy. Today, 14% costs are a major factor. Competition in health care was important. But beyond that, in my visits to the Hill and confirmation, I heard two very liberal Democratic senators, sua sponte, say to me, oh, antitrust in health care, it just doesn't work. We've got to exempt health care from antitrust. I mean, I was horrified. I came back when I was confirmed and immediately called Janet Steiger and told her of this great concern. She and I agreed we would do joint health care guidelines, the first industry-specific guidelines ever. We started into June 1st of July, and they were issued about the 15th of September, and it quieted all concerns. It was They were very useful. They're still in ex existence today, specific examples, mm -hmm. hypotheticals, and so forth. And you formed a healthcare task force to help shape uh, cases in that area. I did, because healthcare is complicated enough that you need people who, as other industries, the division has communications, telecom, and so forth, but it's important to have people who really understand the, the depth of the kinds of issues that come up and have past experience. And the healthcare task force did a great job. We brought a number of hospital mergers, and I think it was uh, very useful to do that. Now, you mentioned that generating more big civil cases was one of your priorities. Uh, how did you go about finding uh, cases to bring? We, we were focused on that from the beginning. One of the early things I did was bring in Ann Jones, who is now a Superior Court judge in Los Angeles, and Max Steyer, who went on to clerk for Justice Souter. They were the civil case unit. Mm -hmm. The reason I did that is because it takes some time to develop new cases. You have to interview a lot of potential witnesses, understand specific industries, and really put some effort into it the division was getting so busy, people didn't have time. I thought it was just important to have a pipeline of cases. And Max and Ann did a great job. They, they came up with 60 cases that turned into preliminary investigations, and I'm sure some number of those became litigated cases. I don't have the figure. Well, Microsoft certainly qualifies as a big civil case, and you mentioned already that came to the division in an unusual way. Why don't you tell us a little bit more about that? Well, because I was focused on bringing big civil cases, which had been a hallmark of the division for 60 years, 
when the FTC deadlocked for a second time 2-2 on whether to vote out a Microsoft complaint, I sat there and I thought, you know, that's a shame. Two commissioners after three years of intensive investigation think there's a case, and maybe there is. And naive as I was, but it was the right <laughs> kind of naivete, I picked up the phone and called Janet Steiger, and I told her I'd seen what had happened, and I said, I wonder if it would be appropriate if the division served as the fifth commissioner to make a decision on Microsoft. And Janet, in one of the most selfless acts of a public servant, arranged internally at the FTC to do that, and it was a unique and I probably never to be repeated situation, the FTC voluntarily link relinquishing a big case to the antitrust division. That's how that case became ours. Now, in my mind, there were two things that were particularly noteworthy about Microsoft. One you've already mentioned, the uh, cooperation between the Department of Justice in the U.S. and the European Commission in Europe, which was uh, unprecedented at the time. The second is the Tunney Act uh, proceeding that followed the settlement with, with Microsoft. One of your colleagues uh, is quoted in the press of the day as saying that that uh, Tunney Act proceeding was more exciting in the O.J. Simpson trial. Can you tell us about that? Well, it was more exciting to me, that's for sure. <laughs> uh, what happened on that, we settled, the EU came over, Microsoft and the division, we had a huge three days of settlement discussions in the conference room, signed a single consent decree that the EU took back to Europe. We filed in, in a Tunney Act proceeding, it was about July 10th or so of 1994. There was no controversy, no one came in, nothing was filed. Judge Sporkin was assigned the case and he didn't enter the decree. About every six or eight weeks he'd have a hearing and nothing would happen and we didn't know what to think but weren't particularly concerned until December. He uh, started reading from a book about Microsoft and read on the record in court I don't remember the book, but the various uh, unflattering things was very upset about it. Well, we didn't know what to make of that, but in early January, uh, a motion was filed to set aside the consent decree, not accept it, and require the division to show the court all its evidence. So after much discussion, the division, although I never personally had a question, we we believed, and I, I believe strongly, that was a violation of the separation of powers for Judge Sporkin to want to see not just the evidence supporting the violations we alleged, but also all of the evidence relating to other possible violations. Uh, I thought that made the judge a prosecutor and was unacceptable. So he and I had quite a frank discussion on the <laughs> record, I would say. I remember telling him at one point, Full judge, and frank discussion. Yeah, you're trying to get in my shirt pocket. You're the judge, I'm the prosecutor. And he said equally frank things. But it was not mean-spirited. It was just uh, heated, I would say. We both were very sure of our positions. It went up on appeal, uh, expedited appeal. The Court of Appeals accepted an expedited appeal, and it was decided in about eight weeks. They reversed Judge Sporkin, and on Microsoft's motion, not joined by the government, uh, removed him from the case, and it was assigned to a different mm -hmm. judge. NASDAQ was another big civil case. Uh, how, did, uh, how did that decision Well, made? believe it or not, I was so focused on big cases, I actually saw an article in Forbes magazine in August of 1993. Somebody could find it if they were interested. The title of it was Fun and Games on NASDAQ. It was one page. I ripped it out, took it back to my dear friend Bob Lighton, who was a Ph.D. economist and a great lawyer as well, uh, one of our deputies right next door to me, and I said, Bob, what do you think of this? I think it's great. Let's do a case on it. So that was how NASDAQ started, and it turned into just a wonderful case, really. We, uh, three and a half, three years later or so, got consent decrees from 24 market makers, the very same major investment banks that you read about today, Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, Merrill, and so forth, uh, agreeing 
not to fix spreads on NASDAQ. Now, this isn't the prices of stock, but it is the prices of the bid and the ask. Mm -hmm. The bids and the ask were always a quarter to a half instead of competitively bid. The SEC followed up with its own rule, and spreads on NASDAQ went from a quarter to a half to one thirty second or less, because after all, how much does it cost to sell one share of stock? So it, it took... We were, there were estimates at the time that that cost, these inflated spreads cost consumers a billion dollars a year. It was a major uh, help to Americans who sold stock. And did uh, the Attorney General have a role in, in deciding to bring that case? She absolutely did. There were people in the division who did not agree with Bob Lighton's and my assessment that this was... Uh, an implicit price fix supported by threats and tra taping of traders that showed that. And uh, it was argued before just Attorney General Reno, she listened, she wouldn't let me talk. She'd say, <laughs> I know what you think, I want to hear what they say. So it was argued out and she listened and asked questions and at the end of it she said, but why do they always quote in quarters? Mm -hmm. And there's really not a good answer to that without huge theoretical economic abstraction. So Attorney General Reno saw the case my way and it was so cute, she said, let's do it. Slapped the table, stood up to her full height and we did the NASDAQ case. She had a wonderful prosecutor's instinct. She had been a prosecutor in in Dade County in Florida for 15 years. People forgot that about her. She had such a strong public presence. She was a marvelous, marvelous lawyer. She had great, great prosecutorial instincts. Uh, finally, you mentioned big criminal cases as one of your goals, and uh, you mentioned already the ADM case. What were some of your initiatives in the criminal area? Uh, we... The, one of the first things we did, which has actually been very helpful, was to greatly broaden the amnesty or leniency mm -hmm. program. And the effect of that was to assure leniency if in an ongoing investigation, one of the uh, people under investigation or companies came forward and said, we'll cooperate. It was to assure leniency to the first to come in. And it secondly broadened it in an case where we had no idea it was going forward, if someone came in sua sponte and told us about it, we also gave leniency there too. We had discretion not to, but almost always did if they fulfill the conditions. And I, my impression is, I know it was true while I was there, it's been a great success. It's greatly increased the number of criminal price fixing conspiracies that we become aware of. But that's very important, but more than that, it gives you extremely high quality evidence. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have to prove a criminal case, obviously, beyond a reasonable doubt. And if you have one of the participants in a price fixing scheme testifying for the government, that's, that's pretty good. So well, this idea, of course, has caught on around the world. Um, uh, antitrust authorities in, in many jurisdictions have adopted leniency programs after the success of the program that you that you initiated. Well, we've talked about your priorities coming into office, um, but things happened uh, that you didn't anticipate, and one of them was the Telecom uh, uh, the Cal uh, Telecom uh, Act. Uh. Very much so, Larry. It basically, to me, came out of the blue in January of 1994. Chairman Jack Brooks and Chairman Dingell of uh, House Commerce and House Judiciary, respectively came forward with the Brooks-Dingle bill allow, setting conditions for Bell Company entry into long distance. That would have repealed the consent decree with AT&T, which Bill Baxter had put in place in January 1st, 84, which I admired greatly. And so obviously the division, because we had enforced the decree for 10 years and had 50 lawyers and economists very, very expert on all the conditions of Bell Company monopoly and all sorts of things related to that, we took a major role uh, within the Clinton administration. And an amazing thing for me personally, Vice President Gore, who had in his uh, work in the Congress had been on both House Commerce and Senate Commerce committees. Obviously, he's a very smart person. He had 
a great knowledge of and passion for telecommunications. He convened a working group every Tuesday morning from 8 to 9 in his office for five or six of us concerned with telecom policy in the administration, and I was privileged to attend those meetings. They happened every week if he was in the continental boundaries of the U.S. or in Washington. Uh, Larry, the amazing thing about those meetings, I never heard a concept of politics. It mm -hmm. was pure policy. It was so completely textbook how the American government should work. I used to think, I wish these could be on C-SPAN. People would not believe that the Vice President of the United States is so focused on this in such a principled way, wanting to get to what works for competition. It was inspiring, and I was lucky to be able to sit and participate in those. You've mentioned um, increased cooperation with the FTC and the joint development of guidelines as an example of that. You mentioned uh, a new cooperation with the European Commission on cases. But another uh, one of your initiatives was to expand cooperation with state uh, attorneys general. Uh, tell us about that. Uh, I was focused on that because in the 1980s, the state attorneys general became very focused themselves on antitrust and often had different views than the antitrust division. And uh, I thought it was important that law enforcement be on the same side of the table. And I thought the way to accomplish that goal was to develop the facts together, work cooperatively with, toward a, view of the, a common view of the law, and I believed if we did that, differences would disappear. And so I asked Milton Marquis, who was in the Virginia State AG's office, to become a special counsel to me in the front office of the division to reach out to state AGs and do cases jointly with them. And I think you came up with some statistics that in our term, we did 37 joint investigations and brought 14 joint cases with state AGs. It's really of a piece with cooperating with the EU, with the FTC on guidelines, with the state AGs. Uh, to me, it's just uh, sort of obvious. Uh, you have scarce government resources. It's important to potential defendants to the bar, that the authorities speak with one voice, that the rules of the road are clear and you don't have conflicting interpretations. It saves government resources. And so I, I thought cooperation with any other agency enforcing antitrust laws, whether state, federal, international, was obviously a good thing to do. Well, it certainly seemed very successful from my perspective working on cases um, with state uh, AGs and working with Milton. And the statistics you mentioned are just for two years out of your three-year oh, tenure, that right, so that's then? an underestimate of the total. Uh, quite impressive indeed. Well, let's talk a little bit about your uh, career after leaving the division. Some were surprised that you joined the business world after leaving the division. You initially went to LCI International, which was then the sixth largest long-distance carrier. Uh, later, you founded Valor Telecom, serving for a time as its chairman and CEO, and after that, founded uh, SoundPath uh, Conferencing. These were significant companies. Uh, Valor uh, had 550,000 rural access lines, as I recall it, and mm -hmm. uh, 1,700 employees, and you uh, ran the company and, and took it private on the New York Stock Exchange. SoundPath uh, provided telecom services, teleconferencing services to law firms, and uh, I remember you saying to me that it uh, grew so that 40% uh, of the AMLA 200 were, were clients of, uh, of SoundPath. Why did your uh, career take this turn uh, when you left the division? Oh, Larry, you know, I, number one, I love telecom. I got incredibly caught up in the issues. It's a to me, the most exciting industry, certainly in 1996 it was, it had everything. It had uh, competitive issues, monopoly, marketing issues, regulatory issues, uh, just an incredible ferment of in interesting things, all of them, and exciting. It's sort of what was going on. So 
I was very desirous of be getting on the competitive side of telecom. I was actually my first job. I was head of the local services division competing against Bell companies at LCI. It was very interesting. LCI got bought by Quest, and I chose not to stay with Quest and decided to start my own phone company, which my husband used to say, just don't sign anything. <laughs> <laughs> he thought it was crazy, but it worked out. I've had a wonderful time in business. It's, it's, it's constantly creative. I mean, for me, law was very creative when you're trying to figure out a case and the theories. It was very creative at the end when you're trying to get the best result. There's a lot of slogging in the middle. <laughs> but in business, although there's some slogging for sure, there's constant opportunities to be creative, think of new things to do. I've, I've enjoyed business very much. Mm -hmm. Well, Ann, we just, we just have another minute. And I'd like to use that minute to um, read the statement that Bob Potofsky released when you announced your resignation. Bob, of course, was chair of the FTC at the time. He said, when the history of the antitrust division is written, Ann Bingaman will deserve a long and colorful chapter. She's made a tremendous contribution for over three years. Ann gave new energy to that agency's mission and focused its efforts on the critical issues. Ann is a first-rate public servant, a courageous and dedicated defender of the competitive process, and she will be missed. I think that sums it up uh, nicely. Thanks very much for talking to Thank us. Thank you, Larry, and thanks to Bob Podofsky for such a generous statement. I was not aware of it before you told me, and I've <laughs> got to call him and thank him. Thank you.